welcome back to the Anti-Social Studies Podcast. Last time, we got through World War II. Hitler rose, destroyed everything, and then died before he could get what he deserved. And out of the ashes, we entered a new post-war world. Today, we'll look at the new global system that gets set up in the wake of European empires. The U.S. gets obsessed with containing things. We go to space, allegedly. China gets mowed, and spoiler alert, the U.S. wins the Cold War. Woohoo! This is Anti-Social Studies. I'm Emily Glinkler. Settle in, and let's go back in time. Act 1, the Cold War. So, we all know the good, red-blooded Americans hate those pinko commies, right? But why? Well, because they're communist? Sure, but why was communism seen as antithetical to our American values? So if you go back and read Karl Marx, which you don't need to unless you want to impress strangers on a train and get yourself on a government list, probably, Karl Marx was pretty clear about what he did not like about modern society. Capitalism, in his mind, was the root of modern evil because it created such widespread inequality. Karl Marx predicted that eventually, as societies industrialize, the poor people at the bottom will realize that there are more of them than there are factory owners, and the common people, or the proletariat, will rebel. And this rebellion will be, as Karl Marx put it, a violent overthrow of the capitalist system. Now, the United States has a lot of values that we hold dear. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, whatever that means. Originally, the inalienable rights, according to John Locke, were supposed to be life, liberty, and property. But the founding fathers took out property as a right. Optimistically, they did this because they knew that it was almost an impossible thing to promise every citizen of a nation. But... Cynically, they also did it because the fact that they owned property, including slaves, was what put them at the top of the hierarchy and gave them privilege. From the very beginning, capitalism has been a core tenet of the United States. So when communists come along saying they want to violently overthrow your entire way of life, that doesn't go over so well to most Americans. By the Cold War, though, most Americans wouldn't have been able to give you that answer if they were asked why they hated communists, but they didn't need to. Because most Americans by the 1950s hated communists because, as far as they could tell, communists were always trying to kill Americans, or at least stop what we were trying to do. In post-war Germany, in Korea, everywhere. In this way, communism is actually pretty similar to how a lot of Americans unfortunately view Islam today. Most Americans know nothing about the religion of Islam, they just know that all around the world it seems like Muslims want to kill us or stop what we're trying to do. This is problematic for a lot of reasons, but we'll talk about it more in a future episode. So, after World War II, the U.S. and the Soviet Union are the last two powers left standing, and they turn on each other. So, if you're the United States, how do you fight a war on communism? I mean, neither side wants to openly fight because now both the United States and the USSR have nuclear weapons. So, they keep things cool and instead just try to expand their influence around the world and gain allies, or at least stop the other side from gaining support for itself. In the United States, this policy is called containment. The U.S. decided, after World War II, that the best we could do was contain communism and stop it from spreading out from the USSR. The idea was that if one country in a region became communist, a domino effect would occur and other countries would fall too. So we made it our mission for 50 years to stop communism, or anything that sounds remotely like communism, from gaining control in any part of the world. I want to be really clear. Officially, the Truman Doctrine, the original declaration of our policy in the new Cold War, said that we would fight for democracy around the world. But that is definitely not what we did. We fought against anyone who espoused communist or socialist ideas, and we supported their enemy, regardless of who they were or what they wanted. As long as you were fighting communists, you had the U.S. support. And if you also were a democracy, then that was just a nice bonus. The best example of this is during the war in Afghanistan in the 1980s. The Soviets had invaded and set up a communist government there, but there were tons of resistance fighters, generally called the Mujahideen. The United States supplied these resistance fighters with money and weapons to fight the Soviets. One of the groups we supported was led by a young man named Osama bin Laden. Yeah, that Osama. So the United States gave weapons and support to the Taliban because they were fighting communists. And then they would turn around and use our own weapons against us in the 1990s. Oof. This is just one example of what's called a proxy war. Basically, the world was a chess match between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Every country was a pawn, and each side would get involved in smaller conflicts, either directly or indirectly. 
So the U.S. and the Soviets never actually fought. The war stayed cold. But they got really involved in other conflicts around the world to gain allies. The two biggest examples are the Korean and Vietnam Wars, where the U.S. actively supported the South in both countries that was fighting against communist nationals in the North. The Soviet Union supported the other side, but they didn't actually send troops like the U.S. did. In this way, both sides could avoid a direct conflict that might escalate into nuclear war. Pretty smart. Also pretty terrible for the rest of the world that had to do all of the fighting. As we were fighting or supporting these proxy wars, both sides were also building up insane nuclear arsenals. At the height of the Cold War, the U.S. had 8,000 and the Soviet Union had 11,000 nuclear weapons. Like, who needs that many? That's crazy. People in this time lived in constant fear of nuclear war. Kids in school did drills to protect themselves from the shrapnel from a nuclear blast. Obviously, a desk isn't going to protect you if the bomb drops on your school, but still. There was a great video with a cute turtle named Bert to teach kids what to do. There was a turtle by the name of Bert, and Bert the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover, ducked and cover. All things considered, it's a pretty adorable way to warn your children about the threat of nuclear holocaust. Also, I'm writing this episode while my students are watching the original Red Dawn, because clearly I'm a great teacher. And if people in the 1980s actually believed that if the Soviets and Cubans invaded, they would do it in rural Colorado, then man, that is paranoia. So both sides have an unnecessarily large nuclear arsenal. But the philosophy was that if both sides had a ton of weapons, then neither side and no one else in the world, would be crazy enough to attack the U.S. or the Soviets because that would mean the end of the world. This idea was called Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD. Honestly, just watch Dr. Strangelove and you'll get the gist. To me, MAD sounds eerily similar to the idea of alliances before World War I, right? Like, no one would ever be crazy enough to start a war with any major European power because that would mean a world war. Enter Serbia. Who knows? Maybe MAD will work forever. I mean, it has so far. But I feel like everyone's forgetting about the little guys. The groups or nations that don't care if the world burns because maybe they can gain something out of the ashes. Or maybe that's what they want to happen. Mutually assured destruction works as long as no one gains nuclear weapons who might not act rationally to avoid a global conflict. Wait, what about North Korea? Oh, damn. So since the United States couldn't achieve tactical superiority over the Soviets on Earth, we decided to race them to space. In the space race. In 1957, the Soviets launched the first satellite called Sputnik, which is the Russian word for traveler. This freaked us out, and so we invested heavily in math and science education and NASA. In 1969, we won the space race by landing on the moon. Allegedly. I'm kidding. We totally landed on the moon. Shut up, conspiracy theorists. But really, if you'll indulge me for a second... Why is the moon landing such a popular conspiracy theory? Like, why do so many people, if you go on YouTube, believe that we really didn't land on the moon? Well, you have to think about the historical context. It's 1969, Woodstock, the Vietnam War, Nixon. There was a generation of young people, especially, who were already predisposed to distrust the government, and they were also on a hefty amount of drugs. The idea that the government was lying about the moon landing to intimidate the Soviets wasn't so crazy to a generation who'd seen the government actually lie about events like the Gulf of Tonkin in 1964, the My Lai Massacre in 1968, bombing Cambodia, and eventually Watergate. Fake news. But if I can for a moment talk about a conspiracy theory that I do like, let's talk about Area 51. So Area 51 is a remote well, area, 75 miles north of Las Vegas, where the government did secret nuclear testing. They detonated atomic bombs to the extent that the land is still uninhabitable. Scientists built a spy plane called the Oxcart that could travel three times faster than the speed of sound at 90,000 feet. And this plane was used in the Vietnam War. But I know, I know. What about the aliens? All right. So this is all according to a book called Area 51 by Annie Jacobson. I haven't done independent research, so this could be untrue, but I really want it to be real. And it also totally makes sense in the context of the Cold War. So, what Annie Jacobson claims is that a flying disc did crash in the desert in New Mexico in 1947. 
There are declassified documents that talk about the U.S. government tracking down two Nazi aerospace engineers who claim to have built a flying disc, which seems to confirm that the government wanted to find out more about the craft because one had landed in their territory. The document also says that they found these Nazi brothers who said that they had had made contact with the Russians, but the rest of the document is still classified. The flying disc was transported to the base we now know of as Area 51 in 1951. That's where the name comes from. And according to an engineer who worked at the base and received this equipment, there were child-sized pilots inside. What? Aliens. So obviously the pilots were dead, but according to this witness who worked at Area 51, their bodies were clearly the result of a Soviet human experimentation program. But wait. Joseph Mengele, the Auschwitz doctor who committed brutal human experiments, had gone missing in the years after World War II, and there were a lot of rumors that he fled to Russia and was working for Stalin. And here's the kicker. According to this witness, the pilots had been made up to look like aliens like the ones described in Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. What? The author of this book asserts that the Soviets sent a UFO and intentionally crashed it in the U.S. The goal was to create a panic, make us believe that aliens were coming, and it would overload our early warning defense system, making us vulnerable to attack. But the U.S. hid away the aircraft instead of revealing it to the public. Whoa. I have no idea if that story is really true, but oh man, do I want it to be. But it really makes way more sense than any of the other stories that I've heard about Area 51. It definitely wasn't aliens, but Soviets trying to trick us into thinking that they're aliens? I mean, that's just a Wednesday during the Cold War. So... For the 50 years of the Cold War, global politics was surprisingly simple because we had what is referred to as a bipolar world. Not that kind of bipolar. There were two poles, or centers of power, in the world, and everyone else on the planet had to operate in relation to those two poles. Basically, the world was divided into the first world, the U.S. and its allies, the second world, the Soviets and their allies, and the third world, everyone else. This third world, Latin America, Africa, and Asia, is going to get stuck trying to navigate their new independence under the shadow of the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And we're going to spend the next few episodes looking at how they did that. But there were also countries who tried to stay out of it. Yugoslavia, India, Indonesia, Egypt, and Ghana formed the non-aligned movement in an attempt to support each other's efforts to stay out of the Cold War. They were like, oh my gosh, we've been dealing with Europe's BS for centuries now, just leave us alone. I sometimes like to imagine the leaders of these countries giving that speech from the Goonies. They gotta do what's right for them. Because up there, it's their time. Their time up there. But down here in the third world, it's our time. It's our time down here. Anyway. So from 1945 until 1992, the Soviets are trying to spread communism and the U.S. is trying to stop it. And one of the first countries to turn red, confirming all of America's fears of a domino effect across Asia was China. Act 2, Chairman Mao. China. Oh, China. You're so confusing and so simple at the same time. China is a land of tradition and continuity, the mandate of heaven, the dynastic cycle, Confucianism. But one guy is going to try to change all of that in the post-war world. And his name is Mao Zedong. So the Chinese were in the middle of their civil war, trying to figure out what their new nation should look like now that they'd gotten rid of their last emperor. But the civil war was interrupted by the Japanese invasion in the 1930s. Remember, this was the event that also put the Japanese on the path to war with the United States. It was like that scene in Wayne's World where they're playing hockey in the street, but they keep having to stop for cars. So the Chinese are fighting their civil war. But when the Japanese invaded, the opposing sides in China were like, car, and then they paused to fight Japan. But then when World War II ended and Japan lost, both sides were like, game on. In the 1940s, the Chinese government was ruled by Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists. They wanted to establish or had to establish a Western style democracy, and they were supported by the United States. But they were being opposed in their civil war by the communists led by Mao Zedong. The communists benefited from the war with Japan because it weakened the government. Also, as the Japanese committed atrocities in China and the Nationalist Army failed to stop them, the communists retreated into the countryside and lived with the peasants. Remember that anatomy of a revolution again? 
Mao Zedong goes to the peasants, the threes, and is like, man, this sucks, right? This war with Japan sucks, and the nationalists aren't doing a very good job of protecting us, are they? And the peasants go, yeah, that sounds about right. And so he gains their support. In 1949, the communists won the Civil War and established the People's Republic of China, which is still in place today. The nationalists fled mainland China and set up their government in Taiwan, where they still are today. And both places claim to be the real Chinese government, which is really confusing. But today we're focusing on what we think of when we say China, the People's Republic of China that controls all of the mainland. So Mao Zedong was radicalized when he was a college student, kind of like every college student. He probably visited home and had arguments with his dad about politics, which is always fun. He quickly rose to be the most influential leader in the Chinese Communist Party, and he was its leader, and thus China's leader, after they won the Civil War. So at first, Mao Zedong followed the Soviet model fairly closely. The Soviets sent tons of aid and advisors to help their new communist ally. And the Chinese also supported other communist movements in the region, especially North Korea during the Korean War. And all of this contributed to the U.S.'s fear of a domino effect in Asia, which is why we fought so hard and for so long in places like Vietnam later on. But Mao disagreed with the Soviets on a lot, and one of the biggest disagreements was over philosophy. Karl Marx had originally predicted that communism was, would come about by mobilizing urban workers in industrial factories. Lenin and his successors in Russia had followed this pretty closely. They focused their attention on the cities and the workers. But Mao had a different approach. He had tried mobilizing workers in the cities, but they weren't really having it. They were benefiting from trade with the West. Remember all those spheres of influence after the opium wars? Europe and the U.S. still had a lot of influence in those port cities, so Mao went to the peasants instead. And this philosophical difference was the beginning of the long Sino-Soviet split. Generally, dictators don't like being told what to do. That's why they became dictators. So Mao is chafing under all of this Soviet advice. And the Soviets see China not as an equal, but as sort of a little brother in their global communist movement. So Mao does a few things in the 1950s and 60s to try to prove that he can do things differently without the Soviets. And they go really bad. Like, really badly. So let's talk about them. First, seven years into his rule, Mao still hasn't fully gained the support of a lot of the intellectuals in the cities. Remember, China has thousands of years of Confucian tradition. Scholars have been the top of Chinese society since the Han Dynasty, but now the Communist Party has replaced them, and they're pissed. But Mao needs these scholars to help him bring China up to speed with the Soviets and eventually the U.S. So Mao issues a thing called the Hundred Flowers Campaign in 1956. He announces, Let a hundred flowers bloom, let a hundred schools of thought contend. The Communist Party allowed people to speak up. People were encouraged to issue complaints or proposals of how to make this new China even better. Does this feel like a trap to you? Yeah, me too. So... Historians aren't sure whether Mao intended this to be a trap from the beginning, or if he was just really naive and truly didn't think people would have many complaints, but ooh, they did. Scholars especially flooded party offices with issues about how they'd been treated by the new government and how they wanted to go back to the old capitalist ways. And boy, did Mao not like that. He was like, nope, this is why we can't have nice things. And he took his ball and went home. People who complained, especially intellectuals, were punished and often sent to work on distant farms or in labor camps. And that'll be important in a second. Realizing that things maybe weren't going as well as he thought, Mao decides that China needs to unite for a new goal, something that would help move China forward, or even make a great leap forward. In 1958, Mao attempts to overhaul the entire Chinese economy, both industry and agriculture. But remember, he's doing this without the help of scholars and intellectuals who've been sent off to work as farmers instead of being engineers or whatever. Uh oh. The Great Leap Forward is easily one of the biggest failures in human history. For example, Mao decided that China's power lies in its peasant masses. So he decides that instead of industrializing through companies and so called experts, he tries to apply communist ideas to steel production, for example. He's like, hey, peasants, there's a lot of you, and we need a lot of steel. What if you each just made steel in your backyard? Does that sound like a thing you could do? And the peasants go, um, no. And Mao's like, great. So in the days before YouTube, peasants were tasked with smelting steel in their backyard to provide to the government for massive building projects. Yeah, it was bad. Bridges collapsed and general failure ensued. There were similar problems in agricultural output. 
farmers were forced to leave their family farms where they had been producing enough food to subsist for thousands of years and live and work on massive communes instead. Various regions were assigned different crops to focus on producing so that then the government could take them up and redistribute them. Yeah, this went bad. Production dropped even before environmental disasters hit. One example that just gets me every time is the Kill a Sparrow campaign. Sparrows were pests that were destroying certain crops, and so Mao has a bright idea, and he issues a proclamation that everyone should just kill as many sparrows as they could find. Without weapons, people would just go outside at dusk when the sparrows returned to their trees and just stand under the trees banging pots and pans. The noise kept the birds from landing, and they fell out of the air exhausted. They drove the sparrows to near extinction. Fine. Except that the sparrows ate a lot of insects that did way more damage to the crops. Ugh. The Great Leap Forward resulted in famine that killed 45 million people in just four years. Since its policies can all be directly attributed to Mao Zedong, it is often considered the greatest mass murder in history. So, other members of the Communist Party are like, yeah, maybe you should go away for a while. Mao steps out of the spotlight and compiles his little red book, a book of all of his sayings and quotes. Basically, he's trying to replace Confucius with his own ideas. After the devastation of the Great Leap Forward, Mao tries to figure out what went wrong. And he also realizes that he needs some new campaign or else he's going to lose this, the people and their support. So Mao comes to the conclusion that the reason why his initiatives have failed so far are not because he knows nothing about the economy, clearly, or it's not because he's banished all of the experts to become rural farmers. No. <laughs> Mao decides it's because the Chinese people are still clinging to the past and are not fully committed to his new vision for China. In 1966, Mao returns to lead the Communist Party and he issues his Cultural Revolution. He stated that China was being held back by the four olds. Old ideas, old customs, old culture, and old habits. He empowered Chinese people to attack the four olds and eradicate them from their communities. And he specifically targeted young people to take the lead in this phase of the revolution. Who better to attack the old than the young? Colleges, high schools, and even middle schools were encouraged to join the Red Guard. These bands of young people with their raging hormones and aggression toward authority figures roamed the streets of China, destroying anything that might be considered part of the old China. Teachers who taught about Confucius, parents who had a Buddha statue in their home, workers who questioned new directives from the Communist Party, officials who still communicated with their Soviet counterparts. These are all examples of people who were punished during the Cultural Revolution. Teenagers also destroyed old monuments, including religious temples and shrines, and a cult of personality developed around Mao. Young people were encouraged to retrace his steps and visit various locations around China that were significant to his life and the Civil War. When they did, they would collect pins or patches as a visible sign of their loyalty. I want you to notice that even though Mao is saying he wants to get rid of the old China, really, he's keeping it around. He's just calling it something new. So he's just placed himself as the new emperor, for example. Even though he claims to want to get rid of everything old, in fact, he's playing off of these deeply ingrained traditions to work in his favor. He doesn't use these words, but essentially he argues that he has the mandate to rule, not from heaven, but from the people. And by portraying himself as a father figure to all of China, he's co-opting the Confucian idea of filial piety, or unwavering respect for one's father. So, during the Cultural Revolution, people who were identified as enemies of Mao's communism were forced to attend struggle sessions. This is where it gets real 1984. They were paraded onto a stage in front of mobs of Red Guard members, and they had to listen as people accused them of worshipping one of the olds. Mao was not specific about what things like old ideas or old habits meant, leaving the door wide open for people to take advantage and get creative. As a teacher, I'm especially fascinated by the Cultural Revolution because I can see how easily that could happen. Think about it. Someone walks into your high school, sits you down, and tells you that you have power. They want you to help them identify enemies of the state. It might be your parents, or your teacher, or a classmate. Anyone who is not a part of the revolution is against the revolution. And that's dangerous as hell. Sometimes these struggle sessions turned into lynch mobs. Teachers were sometimes beaten to death by mobs of students. 
Although possibly hundreds of thousands of people died, many more victims of the Cultural Revolution were not killed, but were sent to re-education camps, where they often had to keep journals of all of their, quote, wrong thoughts. These journals would be monitored by a member of the Red Guard to determine when they had been sufficiently re-educated. Even after they were released, they often couldn't return home, but were sent to work on some far-off farm. And it's impossible to know exactly, but tens of millions of people were persecuted. Over 16 million young people also became part of the Sent Down movement. Young people from the cities were taken out of school and sent down to the countryside to work in farms. This is all part of Mao's efforts to idealize the Chinese peasant, his original and most important base of support. China's current president, Xi Jinping, was part of this movement when he was young. So after the first few years, the Cultural Revolution died down and morphed into fighting between different factions of the Communist Party. It only officially ended when Mao died in 1976, and his gang of four supporters were put on trial and blamed for all of it. This included his wife, Madame Mao, who is generally considered one of the main architects of the Cultural Revolution. Side note, President Nixon's visit to China came during the Cultural Revolution. After China formally split with the Soviet Union, the United States stepped in to try to negotiate a better trading relationship with China. This is just another example of the U.S. supporting anyone who was against the Soviet Union, even another communist nation. After Mao's death in 1976, China sort of came back to its senses. A modernizer named Deng Xiaoping took control and he ruled China through the 1980s. Like his counterpart Gorbachev in the USSR, he acknowledged that China would need some reforms in order to survive. He opened up the economy and allowed for private enterprise, as long as it was under the watchful eye of the Communist Party. It's really because of Deng Xiaoping that China today is this weird mix of communism and capitalism. Deng's famous quote was, It doesn't matter if the cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice. Basically, he's like, I don't care if we're capitalists or communists, as long as we're powerful and wealthy. Well played, Deng. The Chinese cat has definitely caught some mice in the last few decades. But one thing Deng Xiaoping did not reform was the government. And you should be noticing a trend again. Dictators never legislate away their own power. Remember the absolute monarchs of Europe, the Tsar, the Shogun in Japan? So by the late 1980s, many people inside and outside of China were calling for political reforms. In 1989, seeing protests across the Soviet Union for democracy, and it was just months before the Berlin Wall came down, university students in Beijing marched on Tiananmen Square. They were met with tanks and gunfire from the government, and thousands died when the government maintained its power. Interestingly, the Tiananmen Square massacre was actually the beginning of instant news the way we understand it today. CNN had been around for just nine years, and they were the only 24-hour news network, something other outlets thought was insane. You've seen Anchorman 2, right? It's like the whole plot of Anchorman 2. So, in 1989, Gorbachev was visiting Beijing, and CNN had proposed to the government a new idea— allow them to transmit their own video feed of the visit instead of just relying on the state-sponsored video that all of the other news sources would have. China agreed, hoping for good live coverage of their talks with the Soviet leader, but they would regret that. So CNN had a live camera set up on Tiananmen Square when the protests occurred, and people in the U.S. watched for days as protesters filled the square and then as the government sent in troops. They watched all of this live for the first time in history. Reporting on the Tiananmen Square massacre is really what put CNN on the map. So today, China is a conundrum. They are still officially communist, but they've also become one of the largest economies in the world, thanks to corporations and trade with the U.S. and the rest of the capitalist world. So are they still communist? Well, no. I mean, no country that says they're communist are actually communist. Remember, the whole idea of communism was to eventually create an equal society without hierarchy. Countries like China, Cuba, and North Korea all got stuck on extreme socialism. This was supposed to be a stepping stone toward complete communism, where the government would take control of all of the resources and redistribute it out to the people. But the idea was that eventually they would give that power back and everyone would become equal. But the leaders who brought their country along on the revolution were never willing to give up their own power to create a truly communist society. What I've learned from studying world history is that the people who are egotistical enough to think they can lead a revolution or an empire are normally never the people you would actually want leading a revolution or an empire. It makes me appreciate even more the few exceptions who did it right. Cyrus the Great, Augustus, and again, George Washington, man. It would seem that China is still struggling with its identity today. I mean, just recently they abolished term limits so that Xi Jinping could serve as president indefinitely. Sounds kind of Maoist to me. 
If you've studied history, that's never a good sign, but we'll have to wait and see. Act 3, The Fall of the Soviet Union. So over the next few episodes, we're going to go back over this same time period and talk about what was going on outside of the U.S. and the Soviet Union. But I'm going to skip ahead for a second, and I mean, I can because it's my podcast, and let's talk briefly about how the Cold War ended. Basically, by the 1980s, the Soviet Union was experiencing all of the same issues that every massive empire has at some point gone through, going all the way back to Rome. Just like we can copy and paste the way empires are administered from the Persians, we can also copy and paste the reasons for their decline from the Romans. So first, the Soviets had overextended themselves trying to spread communism. For example, they were embroiled in a basically unwinnable war in Afghanistan. They were propping up communist regimes around the world in places like North Korea and Cuba and funding communist attempts to take over governments in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. This was especially important after the 1960s when China split from the Soviets. Another quick note about Nixon, why did he visit communist China? So Nixon had a new strategy on fighting the Cold War that involved two things. First, he promoted detente, or relaxation towards the Soviet Union. He met with Soviet Premier Brezhnev in 1972, and they signed the first Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, or SALT Treaty. This prohibited the manufacturing of new nuclear weapons by either side, which was a big step toward decreasing the global nuclear threat. But the second part of Nixon's strategy was to move away from the tense bipolar world of the U.S. versus the USSR. He intended to use diplomacy to create more poles that could diffuse this tension. And this is why Nixon visited China and asked the U.N. to officially recognize them as the Chinese delegation, replacing Taiwan. Ouch. This strategy of detente and diplomacy ended with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Reagan's approach was much more hardline. He believed that the way to win the Cold War was to push the Soviet Union harder than ever before. And by turning up the heat, so to speak, the U.S. was forcing them to keep spending money on weapons and space racing when they should have been shoring up support at home. One fantastic example of this is Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, nicknamed the Star Wars Program. Reagan hated the philosophy of mutually assured destruction, calling it a suicide pact. And so he called upon the scientific community to create a defense system that would make nuclear weapons useless. Scientists studied lasers, particle beam weapons, and space-based missile systems that could shoot nuclear weapons out of the sky. It was quickly concluded that the world was at least decades away from actually being able to do any of these things, but the Soviets didn't know that. Because of Reagan's hardline approach, the Soviets ramped up spending right at the moment that they should have been cutting back. The Russian economy at home was really struggling at this point. People were having a hard time finding enough food to eat, and so wasn't great that they like ramped up spending when they really should have been making sure that people had bread. So Reagan's legacy is pretty tricky, depending on who you ask and what events you study. But as far as pushing the Soviets to the edge of collapse, Reagan did a pretty good job. But there was one American who did more than anyone else and is never talked about in history books. An ode to Sylvester Stallone. Stallone, you sly dog, you won the Cold War for us. You were John Rambo, the troubled Vietnam War vet who fought the Viet Cong and brought to light the plight of prisoners of war in the wonderfully named Rambo First Blood Part Two. In Rambo Three, you bravely went off to fight with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan against the Soviets. Your movie was even originally dedicated to these resistance fighters until we whew, realized that that included the Taliban and we're like, whoops, never mind. But you didn't stop there, Sly. No, you were also Rocky Balboa, the lovable boxer with a head of steel who single-handedly ended the Cold War. While Ivan Drago needed fancy equipment and blinking lights to train, you just needed a cabin in Siberia. And lifting that wheelbarrow really came in handy in the ring when you were somehow able to lift Drago off the ground, even though he was approximately 3,000 times bigger than you. Drago said, I must break you, but you broke him. And in doing so, you broke down all of the barriers between the U.S. and the Soviets that had accumulated over 40 years in just one 15-round boxing match. Historians like myself consider Rocky's speech at the end of Rocky IV to be more influential to ending the Cold War than Ronald Reagan's tear down this wall. During this fight, I've seen a lot of changing, the way you feel about me and the way I felt about you. In here, there were two guys killing each other, but I guess that's better than 20 million. I guess what I'm trying to say is that if I can change, and you can change, everybody can change. 
Ah, oh, thank you, Stallone, for being a true American hero. All right, back to real history. At the same time that the U.S. was pressuring Soviet spending, they were also trying to rule their massive empire and keep their satellite states under their control. This included dealing with a lot of nationalist movements within its borders. A lot of different groups had been conquered, either by the Tsarist Russian Empire or later by the Soviet Union, and they wanted out. In Yugoslavia, a guy named Tito led an independence movement that was especially embarrassing because they still wanted to be communist, just not with the Soviets. It's not us, it's you. Oof, ouch. Nationalist movements were occurring across the USSR since the 1950s. The most notable places are first Hungary, then Czechoslovakia, and eventually Poland in the 1980s. By the 1980s, there was really a disagreement within the Soviet Union about where they should go next. A reformer named Gorbachev rose to power, and he began making changes within Russia to try to keep the empire together. He's sort of like the Deng Xiaoping, but of Russia. Glasnost and Perestroika were both attempts to open up society and allow for some capitalist measures and freedom of speech. Did anyone watch the final season of The Americans? It's all about this. Like, Philip is okay with reforms, but Elizabeth is a hardliner who doesn't want Russia to be like the U.S. Anyway, these reforms were a good idea, but sort of backfired. To many in the Soviet Union, it was an admission that the goal of communism would never be achieved, and allowing for more openness and transparency just helped the voices calling for independence to be even louder. By 1989, the Berlin Wall came down, reuniting Germany, and in 1992, the Soviet Union officially broke apart. We could spend a ton of time on the Cold War in the U.S. and the Soviet Union. I mean, I could do a scene-for-scene reenactment of the original Red Dawn, if that would be helpful. Wolverines! But since I'm a world history teacher, I really want to spend more time on, you know, the world. So we're going to spend the next few episodes traveling around the world to see what was going on everywhere else after World War II. The Cold War will reach Latin America thanks to Castro and a ship named the Grandma. The Middle East will erupt into chaos after the fall of the European Mandate System. And all across Africa and Asia, decolonization will create new nations that will have to figure out how they fit into this new post-war world. It's all happening in the shadow of the Cold War, and it all matters for your life today. Join me next time on Anti-Social Studies as we explore the Cold War in Latin America and the Middle East, or this is why they hate us there. And don't forget that if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to my podcast so you'll know when the next episodes are up. And if you really like what I'm doing, then go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give me a review. Thanks. Thanks.